Hello, I'd like to talk today about Vaseline Petkov's Relativity and the Nature of Space Time. So this is a book that I originally ran into while I was working at the Small Liberal Arts College. I was teaching modern physics. And one summer I was in Houston. I was working for my old advisor, building a spectrometer. And after I'd get done with the three or four hours of working in the lab that I'd do every day, <coughs> I'd go off and I'd go to the library, I'd read, I'd, you know, write lectures, I'd do whatever, get prepared for the next semester. And this was one of the books I saw there. I think I probably saw the first edition, not the second edition. And I'm not sure if I didn't check the Frontiers collection, I don't think was available then. I don't think it was a thing then. I think this was probably one of the first ones they put in the Frontiers collection. I'm not sure. The Frontiers Collection, by the way, is a set of books that I do like. Um, I don't like all of them. They all vary in quality. There are a couple of them that I really, really like. Uh, I can think of two others off the top of my head, Particle Metaphysics and Decoherence. I think it's just, I think it's just called Decoherence. There might be some more to it. And so I was already planning on bringing these by when I got a comment and somebody was talking about this collection. So I pulled one off. Um, and since it was the first one from the Frontiers collection I'd seen, I thought this would be a good one to talk about. I do like this also because, you know, I'm still coming off of that conference two weeks ago. And so that conference on quantizing time and the nature of space time is right there in the middle of that, right? So this is, at least in my brain, timely. You weren't there, so prob probably you weren't there. I don't actually know who's listening to these. So maybe you all were. I don't know. So this is relevant to that. And a lot of the things that Petkov talks about, you know, is at odds with a lot of the things other people said. You, you know, they are, he's, he isn't at odds with everyone. And he isn't at odds with what everyone wants to say. Um, but there are people in that community, in those communities, like I said before, that are, that have different opinions, right? And they want to build up research programs based on different ideas about the way the world probably is in their view. So that's one of the things I like about this book, right? Petkov has a view and this book is an argument for it. Okay. And so he has an idea about what the nature of space-time is. And if you wander through it, you'll learn about it. Now, this is not super technical. That's about as technical as it gets. Right? So it's, you know, comparing um, space-time intervals or something like that. Oh, well, well, I shouldn't have gone back to the end because there's more. But, you, you know, it's not that technical. Uh, most of it can be done without too much... Um, background. So I suspect anybody who's listening to this would get a lot out of this book. So if you've listened so far, how far are we in? Three minutes? Yeah. If you're one of the people that listens to this, these for more than three minutes, you probably get a lot out of this book. Even just listening to the way he talks about things, even if you don't agree with him, with the things he's saying, just reading the way he talks about things, you probably get a lot from. <clears throat> so He's got this nature of space-time, this view of space-time, and we'll talk about it. Basically, it's space-time is a real thing, whereas some people think it's just an abstraction that we can talk about. Um, so let's find the contents. So what do we have for contents? Introductions. Uh, we've got three parts, from Galileo to Minkowski. That part here is just going to talk about how we get to special relativity and Minkowski space. Part two is um, the nature of space-time. That's really the meat. And some implications is part three. Um, most of those are for general relativity and some more from quantum mechanics. And then there are some appendices. So um, I read this fairly early, even though it looks like I've got notes in the back. They're not real notes. They're something else. I'm not exactly sure what. <clears throat> so, 
you know, chapter two is the impossibility of detecting uniform motion. So that's really important. That's the development to Galileo, right? That's just Newton's first law, really, uh, now that we look at it. <coughs> this is this is really important. This is a really important development in physics, and it took quite some time to do it, obviously. We're going from Aristotle through Copernicus and Ptolemy to Galileo. Right, so first we're going to get to Galileo's principle of relativity. That's the first thing we need, really, for relativity, is the principle of relativity. There are some other things behind that that you get from Newton that give you normal Newtonian physics. And when you get rid of this idea of an absolute space-time, then you get the uh, Minkowski space. Then you get space-time as one thing. So if you don't have this foliation, this con continual buildup, time after time after time after time after time, um, of a present from the past. Um, then there's exploring the internal logic of Galileo's principle of relativity. And um, you get in here the postulates of special relativity. So we're switching from Galileo to Einstein here. And there are some ideas in here. You could think of things here that you should have had enough information, <clears throat> even prior to Maxwell, to figure out special relativity. I think that's a bit of a stretch. Um, you know, people had measured the speed of light, but the relativity idea with the speed of light might have been a bit of a stretch for anybody who was trying to um, figure it out. So actually it was a stretch, right? Now we only have one experiment, you know, our history of science. There could be a completely different history of science somewhere else. So if the space aliens come and you know they've seen this development a hundred thousand times in their giant galactic federation maybe we can get some statistics to see how many people figure out the um, postulates of special rel relativity, figure out rel special relativity before they figure out um, something like Maxwell's equations or even, or even they haven't tested Maxwell's equations first. Because this is a kind of weird idea and I'm not sure that anybody would ever uh, do that. Although, again, I've heard people say that <clears throat> I've heard people say, I've heard, read people really saying that probably that should have happened prior to that. Uh, then he goes through here for relativity in Euclidean space and space time. Um, you know, you get some of your classic um, things here length contraction, the twin paradox, and these other strange things that uh, we're talking about. Um, what's the difference between different kinds of times and things like that. Uh, let me see if I can find something. I think this is one of the earlier spots. So here's, you know, looking at things in different angles b based on your speed. But I think he's got some discussion here. So he's in chapter four about um, here we have, I think these are Liddell diagrams, they may be Bream diagrams. So this is a different kind of diagram. This isn't the only place I've seen this. I haven't seen them very many places though. And what these do, here's actually, this is an old book by Shadowitz that goes through them very, very explicitly. Um, it was later published by Dover and then Dover doesn't publish it anymore, so I have no idea how to get a hold of it. But the whole idea about these guys is that unlike Minkowski diagrams, neither of these are privileged reference frames. So we have the solid and the dashed reference frames. Those are two different people moving at some speed relative to each other that is proportional in some 
it's proportional to, I think, the cosine in this case of the angle between them. I think for the uh, Minkowski diagram, it's the um, tangent of the angle between them. But the big thing here about this kind of diagram, and when you try to use this kind of diagram to explain things that makes it so useful, is that both of these sets of axes, the dashed and the solid, have the same um, units. The, the size of each size of a meter in this reference frame is the si same as the size of a meter in this reference frame. So you can actually use them to do some logical reasoning. So I think that's a really good thing to use in a book like this because the Minkowski diagram, you basically, the Minkowski diagram is good for somebody doing what a physicist does, right? Which is, a, the physicist sits in a laboratory and measures something that's moving really fast relative to the physicist, right? Um, it's not good for general argumentation. It's really not good for beginners. It's really just good for somebody who already knows something about special relativity for them to figure out what's going on. So it's my two cents. I have opinions, which means that I'm going to get dislikes. That's the way the internet works. All right, what's next? Relativity and the dimensionality of the world is space-time real. So this is the first part of his argument. So the first part was just going through and getting used to what relativity is, right? At least special relativity. Uh, the second part is talking about what actually happens because of that, what you can get um, from that. And, you know, the most important things here are, you know, something like the dimensionality of the world. And then we have to kind of get a philosophical idea about what length and time contraction and time delay dilation length contraction and time dilation actually mean. And so we're talking about something about a relativization, relativization of existence. What And again, what does that mean? And then a justification here for why we care about this. Why do we want to know what the nature of space-time is? Well, um, one is simultaneity, right? So for a lot of things that you do in quantum mechanics, you need simultaneity. So quantum mechanics is normally taught, well, is, you know, a non-relativistic phenomenon. You have to use quantum field theory for relativistic phenomena. And so there are things that happen simultaneously that seem a little bit weird. Well, in reality, simultaneity isn't really a thing. That actually has a I don't see it. Oh no, I'll get to that back here. Temporal becoming, there's another idea there. So you have an idea, well, how can, you know, if we have this Newtonian idea where there's a foliation, a foliation, a foliation, there's a new instant every second or every 10 to the minus 43 seconds or whatever it is, and the world is just updating and changing and changing and changing and changing in order in a nice, simple manner it's very easy to believe that there's a present there's a special thing called a present and that present is really the only thing that exists right there's no real past there's no real future there's only a present and the only thing that is coming to us from the past is you know the previous iteration the thing that moved into the next step in time something like that so this idea about temporal becoming is a really important thing and this is one of the things that there was a lot of contention on in that um workshop that conference thing that i was talking about uh, the flow of time what is that we don't know and what's going on with our consciousness we know that there's some sort of time stuff going on there we have some idea of what there being a present, right? We believe there's a present, and that present lasts about one-tenth of a second or something like that. So our actual present is a fixed amount of time. And then free will. So 
when you get into this and you say, okay, well, I can't have this step by step by step by step by step time because of one of these things here. Let's see if we've got the, you know, because, you know, this is our past, this is our future. We like to say this is the present, but, you know, the presence for two different people are different because they're moving at different speeds. So maybe there's, I thought I saw one while I was slipping through here. So the presence, here we go. These slices are at different, these slices are at different um, angles to each other. So really there's these two people here, this guy moving this like this, and this guy moving like this, have different presence. You see, this is a um, diagonal line for the present there. So two people at this same spot have, or really close to it, would have the same future and the same past, but you'd have different um, presence. You'd have different spaces. That's not really viable. That's not a real thing. You can't, if you're updating step by step by step by step, you can't do that. That sort of means that all of this other stuff, you know, everything except up in this cone has to be real. And then if you say there's somebody way over here, then everything in that cone has to be real. All, the, all of that future has to already exist in some strange way. And if that happens, then you have this block universe idea. The whole universe already exists in some way. And that makes free will hard to um, justify. Not impossible to justify, but hard to justify. And, uh, and so, you know, that's up, to you. that's up to you how you want to think about that. But um, it is a problem, and it's a problem that a lot of people care a lot about. Then we get into the implications about space-time for the rest of physics. One, for a lot of these things that have to do with general relativity. Um, what do all of these different things about general relativity mean? You see we have the time delay, the red shift, which is how we measure um, how fast stars are going that are very far away, and so on. Just a whole lot of different things in um, different situations. Uh, calculating the electric field of a charge in a non-inertial reference frame. So that becomes pretty difficult, right? Just think about it. So the reason why we have an electric field and a magnetic field is because of special relativity, right? Because if you had just your charge sitting here, right? And you had a detector just sitting here, then it would just pick up that, pick up the field from here and nobody would be any of the wiser. If it was moving, right, then what happens? Well, if it's moving, then there's a um, there's a transformation between these two things. There's a Lorentz contraction, there's a time delay, dilation. Put those together, you have the Lorentz transformations. And what you see as the electric field becomes the um, field from the contracted object. But that's not the full electric field coming out of this. What you get on top of that is a magnetic field that's coming from the fact that this thing is moving at, a, at some speed relative to you. Now you go over and you go into a non-inertial reference frame. Now, now this guy is accelerating, let's say. Now this, now this guy is going to be in a gravitational field, let's say. What happens then, right? Well, things do happen, and, and it's not actually uh, so horrible, but you get the, um, right, right here, you're calculating the potential of a charge in a non-inertial reference frame. Fermi does that in like, I'll guess 1921, let's say. Um, well, there's no reason to just guess. You know, we got the book here, let's go see. It's gonna be 1935 and I'm gonna be, look stupid. No, it's 1921. I was right. Okay, so um, so you can figure that out. You can figure out that the uh, that there is a change in what the um, electric potential is, the electric field is, 
in a gravitational well in a non-inertial reference frame. And this is all good. You know, these are things that happen, and according to Petrov, this is all because um, space-time is real. Right? Then we have inertia as a manifestation of the reality of space-time. All of these different, so our inertial, yeah, our inertial force is real. Um, inertial forces originate from four-dimensional stress arising from deformed world tubes of non-inertial bodies. What a name for a section, right? Um, electromagnetic mass and inertia in the classical electron and the standard model and inertia. And basically where he's going there is he's saying that you, know, you have your gluons, you have your photons, you have all these bosons running around, and they're interacting with things inside of materials, and those things give you mass. And that would be fine. The interaction between your electron and your photons, the interaction between your quarks and your gluons, those give you mass. That's, that's pretty reasonable. Uh, the thing that gets you is, what about the W and Z particles? They have a mass. How do you fit that in there? Well, not much in there about that, but I mean, there is something in there about that. So something to look forward to in reading the book, if you want to read, a, read the book. Then space-time and the nature of quantum objects. Um, here we have, is quantum mechanical probability objective? He says he's not going to answer that. And then he says the nature of the quantum object and the nature of space-time. And his view here, and the thing he's arguing for, and I think this should probably be contentious, um, is that if space-time is real, then objects can't exist continuously over paths, period. It doesn't say that the objects disappear, it just says they can't be continuous, they can't exist continuously over paths. What that means, I don't know. You'll notice this is also something that's important for, let's say, um, Aronoff and Rorlick in Quantum Paradoxes. And I, that's what I was expecting when I reread this um, chapter this morning. I was expecting them to say more or less the same thing, right? Where, you know, Aronoff and Rorlick said, okay, we can't use these Gaussian wave packets because they violate special relativity. They're nice and easy to deal with as far as solutions to the um, Schrodinger equation are concerned, but I mean, they're just not the things that we need to work with, right? So that's what we've got there. Um, and then we have arguments against the reality of quantum mechanical arguments against the reality of space time. I read that also, that was nice. Um, the nature of space time and the validity validity, not validity, of scientific theories. Um, I did not read that. Um, calculation of the self-force and classical electromagnetic mass theory. So again, a very nice book. Again, it does get a little more complicated later on, but not that much. So I just had happened to find, you know, the discussion of the Shapiro time delay, right? Which was, if you'll remember, the Shapiro time delay was the um, prediction of general relativity that waited until like 1968 or something like that to be detected. The other two being detected very readily, very clearly, very early, right? But um, the time delay took a long time for people to actually be able to test, um, which is what we do in physics. We test theories, right? So very nice book. I liked this book a lot. Um, I'll probably end up doing some other books like it at some point. Uh, go ahead, um, give me your comments about it. Tell me your favorite idea about space time if you like. Um, that's what the comments are for. Um, you know, don't worry about uh, you know, don't worry about other people disagreeing with you. You can handle it, right? That's the way the world is. <laughs> 
people disagree with you on all sorts of things. And if there's anything <laughs> that people really, really, really want to change, it's the nature of space time. At least in my opinion, or at least in my experience, right, with uh, different people sending me different things about stuff. <laughs> people really hate space time. All right. So thank you very much for listening, and I will talk to you again next week. Bye now.